so t- tell me, um, if uh, if you had, imagine this, right? Imagine this. Imagine that um, aliens uh, discover the Earth, mm. and like any sensible aliens, you know, realizing that we have you know, nuclear weapons and a tendency to violence, mm-hmm. uh, instead of landing and sort of walking up and down making meep meep noises, uh, the aliens just choose to observe the Earth from afar and learn about humanity from our, our, our television and film broadcasts. Um, after watching 50 years worth of, of mankind's broadcasts to the world, yeah, wow. to the universe, um, what do you think aliens would identify as the one thing that humankind are most frightened of and most threatened by and uh, feel most animosity towards? What do you think they would identify as, as, as our, our, our arch enemy? So, so they've watched films and movies for 50 yeah, years? Yeah, so if they've watched the last 50 years worth of movies. But they have a longer what, life, great... lifespan. They live for a long time, these aliens. I, well, I, I don't want, maybe if they travel through space very fast. Yeah. So, so relativity means okay. things oh. have slowed down. I don't know if that works. Um, I think... It would be death, but maybe a particular brand of death. Oh. Yeah, like a very long, excruciating, slow, slow <laughs> dissection, human, like live dissection, something like that. That's what I'm most scared oh my of. My God. Is it sun? Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, that's, yeah, that's how many movies. I, well, I, I'd be interested to know what's been on your watch list. I haven't seen any films that have got slow, <laughs> agonizing dissection no, scenes. No, because uh, you're going to make them. it seem realistic in an hour and a half or whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I was gonna, my answer to this movie was, I think, that the, the one thing that humans appear to be most frightened of and most yeah. aggressive towards um, is, is women between the ages of 18 and 30. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> because, because I think I, no matter what, no matter what, uh, what movie you watch or what television series you watch yeah. it feels like you're never long before seeing some young woman get murdered oh that's true okay. um, yeah when we when we were at um film school uh kelly one of the other students he used to joke that like every episode of csi was exactly the same that it yeah. was always um there's a model and mm-hmm. she gets murdered yeah or there's a college student she gets murdered yeah there's a hot model who's a college student <laughs> who gets murdered <laughs> As a college student who's also a model, she gets murdered. Like every episode, it's yeah. exactly the same. It's always a woman between the ages of 18 and 30 gets murdered in yeah. some kind of horrible way. He's ready. He's right. There he is. Um, um, boy, why I, is, but, it? is it? What, well, I was just, what I was going to ask you, why is that? Yeah. Why, um, why have we discovered that um, humans in general enjoy watching um, young women get murdered as a form of entertainment? It's, uh, it's terrifying. This is such a philosophical popcorn counter. <laughs> oh my God! What do they put in the it's popcorn urgent, this week? Though. Um, I wonder if it's envy. Like that's the like eighteen to thirty year old women are, are they're beautiful. They're in great shape. They're healthy. Um, they're at the, the, the height of their lives, and we're envious. Could it be envy? We we want to destroy oh, what we God, can't that's have. That's uh, a dark what? thought, isn't it? it but then, yeah, so, oh, but in that us. case, then there should be lots of movies of of billionaires also getting murdered. Or yeah, uh, in this country, we have this weird worship of. Uh, of billionaires though so and also the billionaires are the ones who are paying to have the films made so they're not going to sign <laughs> off on that right <laughs> not going to make themselves a target that yeah, would be stupid yeah. so i don't think that's a strategy. I, yeah, I, yeah interesting so i looked this up actually yeah uh, thinking that we might talk about it so i uh, i had a uh, look on uh, on the internet which mm-hmm. is the source of all human knowledge and um uh, are a few different articles that point to this paper from 2010 it was published in social psychological and personality science um, That's so a magazine. So this is a re- this, is, this is a real journal. journal. Yeah, this is act- an actual kind of psychology journal. Okay. Um, so it's uh, an article. Um, it's a, a study by uh, two psychologists called Vickery and Fraley, mm-hmm. uh, which is called "Why Are Women Drawn to Tales of Rape, Murder, and Serial Killers?" Yeah. Um, and what they did was they um, they kind of observed that, especially um, these kind of tales of murder. Uh, are very popular among a female audience and try to figure out why that Mm. is. So they they kind of wrote here, women are overwhelmingly uh, tend to choose true crime books over other violent alternatives like war or gang violence. Okay. Um, And interestingly, women were more likely to choose a true crime book if it included a clever trick that the victim used to try and evade their attacker, especially if the victim is a woman. Mm. So what they suggest is that the, the reason that we 
like watching, especially the reason that women like watching violence against women, is because it's a form of rehearsal. That actually we enjoy um, imagining how we might get out of this situation if we were the ones who were being targeted. Oh. So rather than being envy, it's planning. It's actually, it's, it's, you know, it's check the exits and always carry your keys in your hands. that You can slash at somebody who tries to grab you. And I also, I read an interview with um, a psychiatrist, a Sharon Packer. Uh, it might be Packer, it might be Parker. I can't read my handwriting mm-hmm. at this point. Okay. Um, uh, uh, who uh, also did some work into why people like crime and violence in fiction. Uh, and she suggested the reasons are, first of all, schadenfreude. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, it's just a, such a human trait uh, to enjoy mis- the misfortunes of others. This is one thing I don't understand. Why isn't there an English word for schadenfreude? Because when the, it strikes well, me as such a very English emotion. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the Germans just do those compound nouns so well. There's, oh, they do, don't they? Yeah, what would schadenfreude be? And it'd be like a, a misery of others or something like that. And enjoying the misery of others, it's just not smooth. Yeah, schadenfreude something like that, smooth, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I remember my brother telling me that in uh, when in his in his um, German final exam, I think he did German for A level, mm-hmm. uh, which is like the kind of eight, the exams you take when you're 18 in yeah. this country. Um, and uh, he was saying that um, he had to write an essay about something, and basically he made up a whole bunch of words which were just stringing together other words <laughs> to make these big words, and apparently got them all right yeah. just by just by inventing bigger <laughs> German words. You can't. We really are allowed to just string random words together to make something. Oh, that's um, and then, so the other thing the psychiatrist points out, she was saying that. Um, it's uh it's like it's um relief uh that that you are not the victim mm. so she says that, uh, that the human mind figures if something bad is going to happen well at least it happened to somebody else precisely that's good yeah hmm. so so yeah we enjoy violence but we enjoy thinking well phew yeah you know the serial killer murdered that person not yeah. me so it's this uh it's inability to divorce sort of reality from fiction in the sense that okay that just happened the likelihood of that happening to me is super small is that it? <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's it. But then you would think, then then you would think movies about lottery winners would be extremely unpopular. Yeah. Because you know, watching that, you would think, oh, someone's got to win the lottery, and oh, damn, it was that guy. <laughs> Nicholas Cage won the lottery. Yeah. That means my chance is blown. <laughs> really, you'd think then there would be lots of movies about people failing to win the lottery. They should be the <laughs> yeah. most popular movies. <laughs> God, at least they're not using up all the good luck. Oh, um, and then interestingly, so there's two other things that she yeah. suggests. One is that it's about rehearsal. So um, mm-hmm. seeing these terrible, violent things happen, it means that we know what to expect if the worst happens because we've kind of rehearsed the worst yeah. happening. Hmm. Um, and then in the, I thought the most interesting point we made, she makes um, in this article is not just um, relief that the bad thing didn't happen to us. Mm-hmm. It's also a sense of relief that we, the audience, didn't commit the murder. Oh. Ooh. So going back to that Patricia Highsmith yeah. notion. I that, knew you were going um, there. I knew you were going ah, there. Oh, I'm so predictable, yeah. aren't I? Oh, man, I am sorry. No, no, no. no, so, no. So, so, like, uh, so her, her, big, her big idea is that evil um, you know, is, is present in everybody. Yeah. And I, you know, and I think that's probably true, mm-hmm. don't you? I think that you know, in the same way that all people are capable of tremendous kindness – People, you know, everybody probably is also capable of terrible violence. I think it probably is in everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there is this sensation that a murder has happened, but thank God we, we, the audience, were not the murderer. Yeah. We have been able to contain our impulses and our, our worst instincts, at least this time round. Somebody else committed this murder. Yeah. Which I thought was a, you know, was a fairly insane way to look at it, but maybe that is part of why we enjoy these things. I think so, yeah. And I, I know that personally I hold two sort of incompatible truths, and they are that um, I hate seeing that stuff in film and TV, especially just as a writer. It seems like an unoriginal thing, but Kelly's absolutely right. You have to have that murder of the young lady in every episode of CSI. <laughs> and at the same time, I think that's the appropriate place for it. It's We shouldn't see it in the real world. We should see those things on screen and not have them... Uh, invade our real lives so i mean i'm trying to hold those two things at the same time um and i think that's so not a danger that it normalizes violence though oh absolutely um, that's yeah i think that's definitely the danger. i don't know whether do you remember the 70s series starsky and hutch love it, which love is, it. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah so it's kind of big 
cop show. It was yeah. a big thing in like the like late seventies, something like that. It's two very charismatic leads, great yeah. fun. And like I remember that first appearing on television. I must have been like you know, I don't know eight years old or something like that, because like I remember my parents talking about it the night after the first show had aired. Yeah. And apparently Starsky and Hutch was you know, shockingly violent and far too violent to be shown before about ten ten o'clock at yeah. night yeah. in the UK. And then um, I can remember maybe only sort of 10 years or 15 years later, Starsky and Hutch was being shown at lunchtime in yeah. the UK yeah. that, um, that it was now considered perfectly tame enough that it could follow on from children's programming at 12.30. Um, and I wonder whether there has been an element of normalisation of this hyperviolence. Yeah. Actually, you know, yeah. where, uh, you know, by the time you get to the age of 12, you've seen so many violent murders on TV that you're kind of just desensitised. Yeah, desensitised to it. Desensitized to it. And I can see the good in that. It's like, okay, it's no big deal. Um, so you're not going to make it into a big deal, but it seems a little creepy, yeah. And But I grew up on watching Starsky and Hutch after school. I would come right home and I could watch Starsky and Hutch immediately after school. And some of those programs, I think, got less violent. I remember um, Gunsmoke. I don't know if you ever saw that. It's a Western uh, oh. uh, TV series in the States and came out, started in the 50s, went into the early 70s, I think. So it had a long run. And uh, the a DVD volume set fell into my hands uh, a couple of years ago, and I started rewatching that. And the first season or two, there's just a lot of gunfights and a lot of violence, and it, they intentionally sort of weaned off of that much. I mean, the whole the whole premise of every show was that Matt Dillon, the sheriff in town, was going to um, get into a gunfight with some gunfighter, and someone was going to die. It was always going to be the bad guy, um, <laughs> and then. The, he actually, at the beginning of the show, he used to walk through the cemetery in the town and all these gra gravestones were there and, you know, he'd probably killed half of the people in there, but um, <laughs> they intentionally went to other sort of storylines as the seasons uh, went on and as the, as the sheriff, it was the same actor for many, many years, um, as he um, got older, there was just less violence and as the series got older, there was less violence. So I think maybe Starsky and Hutch did that as well. Where to grab attention, yeah, it seems that films do it all the time. There's always a, very often a murder early on in a film, uh, um, and it's it's just attention grabbing. So it gets your audience somehow. It is a peculiar attraction that we have uh, to. I say for Gunsmoke, that does seem like betraying the audience. If you call your show Gunsmoke, yeah, then surely people are going to tune in each week waiting to see <laughs> some Gunsmoke. Please, yeah. look, it's there in the title. There is still Shoot something. Yeah. There for God's still, sake, yeah, that's what I'm paying for. <laughs> there was still plenty of violence and plenty of uh, gunfights, but they were a lot. The first season, I remember watching, just <laughs> the body count in every half hour episode was just enormous. So I think they started to realize, oh, we got to keep. First of all, we got to keep some characters <laughs> alive, <laughs> um, and we just have to make it less violent. Is it just as he got older, his aim got worse, <laughs> so there was just as much smoke, but nobody got hit in the end. It was yeah. just ricocheting all over the place. Logical, yeah. Oof. I mean, I do find, yet yeah, as I get older, I have less and less taste for yeah. violence now. Yeah, I think that... I don't know whether this is something to do with having children or just becoming older conservative, but I find, yeah, I find violence more and more of a turn-off now. I remember going to see um, Zodiac and finding the, the violence in that. Yeah. Oh, just far too, um, far too malign and explicit for me to feel at all comfortable watching it. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, uh, a few years earlier, I... You know, really enjoyed um, something like Starship Troopers, which is arguably far more violent, although you know in a cartoony way. Yeah. I mean, these days, I you know, I, I would certainly hesitate to show my children you know anything that's terribly violent. Whereas when I was a boy, you know, the thing that would get um, films uh, certificates uh, a higher rating would usually be sex content instead of violence. Yeah. You could kind of watch as much violence as you liked, but if somebody showed you their nipple, then that was definitely, Ooh. you know, that was going to be a 15 rating at least. Yeah. Um, it's interesting in how, how it's handled, how violence is handled. Um, I'm going to just talk about two films that we've seen on, on the podcast. Do you remember Red Notice where the body count was enormous and there was very <laughs> yes. little blood and it wasn't terribly violent in, in that way and it wasn't treated as being serious? Um, and then when we just saw RRR, which has like, hundreds if not thousands of pretty pretty violent murders and deaths and <laughs> on the battlefield or whatnot um that is they're just treated so differently and the, and that you know i would argue that maybe rrr is the the lighter of the two films because it breaks into song once in a while you know and it's uh <laughs> so it's it i think what happens is it's very rarely treated 
naturally. I guess it's very rarely realistic. And when it is realistic, I think um, that's when it's at its most profound. I'm not sure if it's at its most dangerous in those moments. So that's the things that I mean, like um, we've talked about Hitchcock a little bit and his attitude. You know, there's one murder in Strangers on a Train. Um, you know, murder should be difficult. It should be. It should take a little while. It shouldn't just be a quick gunshot and then you're walking on and killing someone else. So um, I think we depend on it for a lot of story just because it's naturally tense. It's naturally um, dramatic. Um, but I think when you you sort of dilute your scripts when you have lots and lots of murders in there, and I think it just makes every the other elements and the other things in the scripts less meaningful. So that's the desensitization piece. I think... For me, it's a cop out very often. Like it's it's lazy just to have a lot of murder in order to propel your story. So, I've definitely worked on trying to avoid it or minimize it. And I've even written violence out of scripts after I've gotten some notes on them or whatnot, and just try to do something more creative. So I think very often it's just uh, we do it by rote in some ways. And you see it in films like Martin Scorsese is a great filmmaker, but he always seems to really need a little extra violence, a few more murders in his scripts to make them work. And I just think. Feels a little lazy to me. Ah. It's low hanging fruit, I think. I mean, I think you can. I, I would. I just lean towards more creative stories and more, just more interesting stuff. I don't find it particularly interesting, but there are a lot of people um, who you're right, and a lot of women. This is true. Now that I'm thinking about it, who um, do follow those crime shows, the the Dateline uh, shows here in the United States, where they're just invested. They talk about a different murder every week on on television and go into detail about it. And there are a lot of women who watch those programs. So. And you're absolutely right about all the, the CSI things or the 18 to 30-year-old women getting killed in all these television programs. But it's lazy. I think I, I just think there are more interesting things to write about and uh, just more creative ways to get yourself into an interesting story and get yourself back out of the story. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, violence is kind of you know, best when it's used very sparingly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it should it should give you a story, perhaps, but it doesn't. It shouldn't be the whole story, I suppose. Oh, that's good. Oh, I'm going to write that down. That's good. But the caveat is, we are two middle aged guys who are getting older, and we don't like the violence as much as we used to. <laughs> yes, just play us a nice song and do a dance. That's what we like. <laughs> well, yes. That's why our yeah, our was entertaining <laughs> once in a while because <laughs> after they would do that, they would dance around beautifully choreography yes. and uh, perfect storm. Sing, yeah. Yeah. Yes. The win win, exactly. <laughs> Get the murders out of the dancing. <laughs> oh, goodness. We're bad. Mm-hmm.